Welcome to Sardar TV, an idea-sharing platform founded by Russell Sardar, who's an author, investor, and the CEO of Netcom Learning. We're pleased to have Tom Donahue join us today. Tom is the founder of the digital advertising agency called Level Agency, and he's also the author of a new book called The CEO's Digital Marketing Playbook, The Definitive Crash Course and Battle Plan for B2B and High Value B2C Customer Generation, and he's here to tell us more. Tom, thank you so much for joining us today. It's great to have you here. Good to be here. So tell us a little bit about yourself and your background, your education, how you got to where you are today. So grew up on a small farm about an hour outside of Pittsburgh. Um, was kind of in love and very comfortable with most things quantitative, um, liked math and calculus and physics. Uh, physics was actually my first major in college. Went to Penn State for undergrad, which was a good place to to find yourself and bounce around um, and have, you know, two dozen majors. Came out with a degree in finance, went to New York City as quickly as possible because I had enough farms for, uh, for a 21-year-old um, and s fairly quickly got a, uh, a job near Wall Street with a, um, a financial company where they had just started using digital advertising and that was around, it was early 2000s and so that's right when that science and art and the tactics started to be a little more advanced and sophisticated. So that's pretty much kind of when Google became Google, um, early 2000s, around 2000, 2001. So I was able to be in the room with the men and women who 20 years ago helped to build, create, and perfect some of the tactics that people still use today. So made absolutely no money at all, worked really, really long hours, but it was um, that singular experience professionally was that's probably the foundation for not only what I do today but my company and and um, it was a phenomenal way to start so did that in New York uh, for quite a few years um, went back to Pennsylvania where I grew up and uh, started the company in 2010 mm -hmm. so and here we are so the name of your company is called Level Agency it is Level Agency yes tell us a little bit about the agency some of the areas that you focus on sure so Level Agency is a customer generation digital marketing agency. So we use primarily all of the digital advertising and marketing tactics that we feel are uh, heavily tied to um, profitable marketing endeavors. We do some um, offline or non-digital uh, marketing tactics. We, do, uh, we run a call center. Uh, we do some you know, old school things like direct mail campaigns. But primarily we try to be uh, one of the best uh, practitioners at digital marketing and advertising. Uh, to try to have uh, help our customers generate more clients. So we work with, um, we're a little unique, um, a lot of digital agencies work with what I'll call mass market uh, B2C, uh, e-commerce stuff, things you buy in, at, the, at the mall or on Amazon. Um, our agency focuses on industries and verticals that have longer sales cycles. So B2B and what I'll call high value B2C. So um, goods and products and services that for consumers that are pretty expensive. Um, so in both of those environments, both in the B2B world and in expensive stuff, B2C, high value B2C, um, you know, you're not seeing an advertisement for something and then buying that thing or making a decision within five minutes. You're not putting something in a shopping cart. And so in that world, um, that uh, deals with, again, a longer sales cycle, things like um, a prospective customer becomes a lead and then a qualified sales lead. And then there are conversations with a sales team and then they become a customer uh, of our clients. In that, that kind of process, those are um, the types of marketing worlds that, that we operate in for our clients. So who are some of your customers then? We started um, primarily in higher education, um, and that is uh, probably because where my executive team and I came from prior to starting the agency, we just had some good contacts and, and knowledge of that space. Um, and then we've grown into Again, within the high value B2C space, we work with banks and healthcare companies and schools quite a bit. And then about five or six years ago, and still today, I, I think B2B as, a, as an overall opportunity to do really, really good digital advertising within that space, which obviously is massive, um, there's just not that many agencies doing it, I think, well, and I don't think there's that many clients that understand the, the genuine upside and ROI potential of doing just really good digital advertising and helping them build a sales pipeline. So there's not that many agencies that I've seen 
that are really, really focused on B2B as well. Um, so about five or six years ago, we, we, we made a good push into that, and I think we're getting known on a national basis um, as a pretty good digital marketing partner for, for B2B clients. That's great. Which is neat. Yeah. The downside, though, is my mom doesn't know the names of or she doesn't recognize the names of most of our clients, but <laughs> um, but uh, so we don't really work with like the Cokes and Pepsi's of the world. But um, yeah, we've got uh, we, we work with um, smaller startups and some um, you know forty billion dollar top line rev companies. So a, a huge range, yeah, but typically companies that my mom doesn't recognize. So, so how, how big is your team? Uh, we have about 75, 70 to eighty people, um, and most are in the wonderful Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, I'm the guy who, uh, who lives on airplanes, so. So you wrote your first book, The CEO's Digital Marketing Playbook. Tell us a little bit about the book. About two and a half years ago, I wanted to put uh, not just thoughts on paper, but um, my, uh, the tactics that I personally and my agency kind of run on a daily basis. Um, it was more for a playbook internally, so when we would uh, hire awesome smart men and women kind of straight out of school we have to train them in what we do and so it was primarily for you know an internal playbook um, it became much more of a um, I feel there's a, a significant need in the market for a, a book that helps executives be able to quarterback 21st century marketing in their companies and mo there's a ton of books in so about social media that there I mean there's a lot of books about marketing and business and social media, very, very few are actually able to um, give an executive or a, or, or a team a playbook, a uh, step-by-step. So both the, the strategy is really re important, but if it's just talking at a high level and doesn't really get to like the actual tactics, I don't know how effective that is. So the book went from um, more of an internal document, playbook for my agency and my coworkers, to, to something for a larger audience. So then who would benefit from reading your book? So the book is hopefully going to be um, the primary resource that whether you know, a CEO or a chief marketing officer or an executive of a company or an actual marketer um, or a sole proprietor, a small business owner, um, it is both the here's what you're going to use, platforms like Google and Facebook and LinkedIn and things like landing pages and some baseline ways to track performance. So like these are the things you're going to use. These are the things that are the most important in this order. And these are actually step by step uh, directions on at least how to launch, um, we'll call it the phase one campaigns, the things that uh, you don't always need an agency like ours to, to run. Um, so it's absolutely the, the high level understanding of why we're doing it and very much the step by step, this is how you can in 200 and some pages after you get done reading it, next week you'll probably have a live marketing campaign that you built. So, In your book you actually point out that there are several high-level executives and leader CEOs within organizations who don't know a lot about specifics around marketing and terminology and technology. Yeah, it's, um, I've always, I'm continually surprised that um, in the, in, in the 21st century when we've had Google for 20 years. That was something that I, I would consider, and again, it's, it's easy because I've been doing it professionally forever, so obviously I think it's, uh, it's, it's pervasively known. But it's really surprising that something that's been around for 20 years, like search engine marketing, um, is very infrequently understood at a, a decent, applicable level by executives, the men and women that run companies in this country. And I don't care if it's a hundred billion dollar top line rev company or a startup. It, it is very surprising that in the, the areas of things within the company, accounting and legal and marketing and sales and operations. So these are the things that every company uses. In most of those things, executives of companies have enough of an understanding of those different areas to manage a team or to hire a hire a law firm or to, or to have internal accountants or, or to, to run a sales team. In the world of marketing, um, it is sur surprising that um, for a few different reasons, there's really not that much understanding of the difference between an or, uh, SEO and SEM. Things that, that aren't, aren't just obvious to a marketing professional, but if you don't know the difference um, 
if you don't understand why you should use um, search engine marketing for your product or why social media can help you get more customers and it's not for just getting likes um, or retweeting things. Like, if, if you don't understand why you should be doing these things, um, it's going to be really difficult to have a profitable marketing entity within your company. And so a lot of today's marketing does focus on those types of things, like you said, clicks yes. and Facebook likes yep. and things, and not enough on ROI. Um, on, on your marketing campaigns yep. and advertising campaigns. Why is this happening and how do you recommend that? Sure, so the reality is, so marketing changed about 20 to 25 years ago definitively. And, and not just in terms of, of the devices and not just uh, strategically, but in terms of what it should be doing. And I don't really think in many other um, professional areas, you have such a cataclysmic, the stuff that was done 20 or 30 or 40 years ago, and the strategies and the expectations, they're not just irrelevant, they're almost the opposite of what you should do and what you should think. And I don't think in many other fields, aside from marketing, you have such a, um, like the, the, the antithesis is actually the reality. And so here's what I mean by that. In like the days of Don Draper, things like um, you know, whoever had the best slogan, like you just had to make a good uh, catchy TV commercial or a slogan and that was, and the creative process was the only thing, it was the most important. The thought that marketing isn't always accountable for sales and ROI, that um, you know, you've got to have the best singular slogan or, or catchphrase or TV commercial, um, th those kind of, um, that, that a marketing professional's opinion matters or how I feel about you know, my, my company's logo or marketing tactic overrules what the clients feel or what the prospective customers think. Methodologies that were run in the 1930s to 1980s are not just irrelevant, they're actually damaging. So if you're using the same rhyme and reason in running marketing in 2019 and 2020 that you know, generations before like your mom or dad did, it's not just not effective, it's actually damaging. And so that plus the fact that people don't go to school for this. You know, there's 3,000 colleges and universities in the United States, and there are so few today that have bachelor's degrees in digital marketing. So people aren't getting trained in this, and even if they were, there's just not, uh, not, not many places to, to have this best practice kind of trickle into, you know, boardrooms. So what are the KPIs and the different yeah. indicators that executives should be focusing sure. in on. If, if from a marketing standpoint you're not talking about um, cost per acquisition, if you're not tying in marketing dollars out to real sales leads, qualified sales leads, real revenue, real new cost, net new customers, if you're not tying in your actual marketing campaigns to those net new customers um, and some of the touch points in between, so inquiries or leads, uh, conversations that your sales team have had, and then new customers. If you're not tying those back to the actual marketing dollars, that is guaranteeing that um, you're probably setting money on fire. So the KPIs, look, the most, important, the, the most important number in the world of marketing or KPIs should be cost per acquisition. How much did it cost for you or that campaign to get one new customer? And that is, you know, if there is one, like one ring to rule them all from a KPI standpoint in marketing, or as a CEO, what, what you know, he or she should demand from a marketing department, um, it's a cost per acquisition. You mentioned you know, marketing, advertising has changed so much over the last few years. What are some trends that you're seeing and what have you seen over the last couple of years? So I started in, again, the early 2000s. So I've got, um, I'm pretty young for most other professions, but in digital marketing, I'm, I'm kind of a grandfather. So I, I can say like, I've been around for most of it, which is uh, a nice, Again, in other fields, I, I, I'm still a kid. Um, but in the past 20-ish years, um, there was about five, six, seven years ago, the ability to not abandon, but really deprioritize creative. Things that you could get away uh, from a successful digital marketing campaign. You know, spending money and being quite profitable at getting net new customers. You could get away with um, deprioritizing how good your copy was. Um, how good your creative was, the content, the, what, what you're sharing with, with an audience or prospective customer. Um, it didn't have to be that sophisticated. Um, 
as an example, you, you could advertise on social media with a, you know, a, a stock photo and uh, a pretty short call to action. And that, and that could make you a ridiculously uh, a ridiculous amount of money uh, if you were good at targeting. So it, it's changed probably around in the last three or four years significantly. And not just, uh, not just social networks, search engines as well, uh, and display or, or banner ads. Um, you know, in those vehicles, uh, in those marketing vehicles, uh, about three or four or five years ago, you started to see a, a trend to, and maybe it was the audiences got more sophisticated or more annoyed because advertisers and clients weren't putting in the effort to good, do good content, things that are compelling that you want to read or, or watch. Um, so you could really get away five years ago with targeting someone, like if you're, if you're the exact right customer for my client, and I know exactly who you are, that the creative wasn't really that important, it was about targeting, and now it is very much you have to have both. Uh, I think the, the, the easiest examples are uh, a Facebook, and uh, LinkedIn kind of, is getting there, but a, a Facebook in particular is really pushing for advertisers, if you want to be successful, um, the message and not just static image versus a video, but like the things that you're sharing with your prospective customers, it's gotta be, it's gotta be compelling, it's gotta be good. It's gonna be well written and good images and good video. Um, so th that's changed, I, I don't see that slowing down. I think the, the, the weight and focus on the creative process, um, it, it's been a nice kind of resurrection. The other thing that you had mentioned earlier was how a lot of executive CEOs maybe don't even know some of these marketing terms, mm -hmm. what the differences are, SEO, SEM. Yep. Tell us what the difference is between SEO and yeah, SEM so and again, what's in, better. In general, it's, it's, I don't want to come out of the gate and just blame executives for not being digital marketing professionals. You know, as, as, and aside from chief marketing officers and VPs of marketing, the men and women that run companies or on board or on boards or on an executive team, it, you don't have to be an expert in digital marketing. You do have to understand the difference between what search engines can do for your company and social networks and how you should spend money to get more customers. So it's less about you need your CEO to be able to sit down and run a Google Ads campaign. It's about the CEO and his or her executive team has to understand the upside and the potential profit and the, 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 the standards, the expectations you should have if you want to manage a good marketing team. So as an example, it is very surprising. Uh, and I would bet, and maybe in a few years I'll actually uh, do the qualitative research. If I asked 100 CEOs, uh, whether it's startups or companies that are you know, 100 years old. So if I asked 100 CEOs what the difference is between SEO and SEM, I guarantee you less than 10 of them would know the difference. And, and here's why that's important. Search engines are the biggest and best and most profitable driver of net new customers for nearly every company on earth. So it's a big deal. So in the world of like spending money in marketing to try to get more customers, understanding even at a very, very basic level what search engines do is super important in everyone's business on earth. And if you don't know the difference between search engine optimization and search engine marketing, which is basically the paid stuff versus the organic stuff, if you don't know the difference, let alone the value propositions and what you can and can't do here and what you can and can't do here, if you don't understand that at a fundamental level, you're not going to um, likely hire a marketing executive that might not know the difference, and he or she might not have a team that knows the difference, or they might pick an agency that's not very good because they're not able to, to be a good arbiter of a good versus bad agency. So, so as an example, um, using, again, search engines like Google are a really obvious thing. They're insanely important, and most companies on Earth, that will be one of the best levers of profitability. And if a C-level executive doesn't know the difference between those fundamental things within a search engine, how are you possibly making good decisions or how are your employees making good decisions? You also talk about customer generation marketing. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. You know, the, the, the call to arms of customer generation marketing, the reason I like that phrase and I try to use that in, in marketing conversations, it, it's less of a thing because and it's more of a restatement and a promise and a like call to arms that if you're doing marketing, if you're spending money in marketing and you're not focused on getting new customers and you're talking about anything else, like what's the point? 
And so I think as business professionals, uh, marketing has in the past been seen, and I've, before I started my company, I was an employee working for giant firms that often did treat marketing like this, where it's a thing that you spend a tremendous amount of money and time in doing stuff, and it was not tied to generating customers, it was because your competitors are doing it, and it's a perfunctory thing, you just should do it because you should do it. And why are you spending, why are you going to this conference or why are you running this kind of campaign or why are you doing that media? Like, and most, not always, but often, the answer is, well, we've always done it this way. We did it last year. Or our big competitor down the street is doing it, so we should too. And so you should talk about generating net new customers profitably when you're talking about marketing. And the, 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 the likelihood um, and the ease by which I think we as marketers and professionals forget that marketing is about driving new customers, it's really easy to forget that. It's really easy to slide into the, um, we're just doing it because, you know, that's how my daddy did it. Um, so that's why I, I, I try to frequently mention when we talk as an agency or, or individually I talk about marketing, um, talking about return on investment, talking about customer generation. Because that that, that's the reason we do the thing. Um, and it's really easy, I think, to forget. So would you say digital marketing is the best, most cost-effective so, way so, to so gain new customers? Not only would I say that digital marketing is, is the most effective vehicle or vehicles to get new customers. Um, it is data driven and it is, um, it is as certain as the sun will rise tomorrow. So yes, digital advertising for the vast majority of companies on earth is the most effective and profitable means to generate new customers. You mentioned data driven. Mm -hmm. which digital advertising you say is. Yes. How does this compare to more traditional marketing practices and advertising practices? So sure, so the, the, the thesis of advertising and marketing throughout the years, whether it's digital or you know 100 years ago, um, has been trying to put the right ad in front of the right person at the right time for a good price. And so that, that desire hasn't changed. Um, you know, the, the Don Drapers of the world uh, on Madison Avenue, um, throwing up billboards on I-95, like that was still, or you know, people that run Super Bowl commercials or, or, or create those, uh, or spend money on those. You know, that's still like the desired outcome. Um, the reality is, with not just the advent of the internet, but platforms like search engines and social networks in particular, their ability to actually deliver on that, right ad from the right person at the right time for a really, really, really good price, it delivers on that promise. And the reason it does that is that digital advertising, again, mostly search engines and social networks, it does three things better than traditional. Number one, it's quantifiable. And if you can tell me how many customers you got from that billboard on I-95, um, you know, I'll, I'll meet you on your yacht because you'll, you'll, you've solved a thing that in traditional advertising you, you can't get. And I understand uh, there can be um, attempts made within TV, print, radio, billboards, you know, out of home, those kind of things. You can do what's called get a direct response thing. Uh, call this number or go to this website. I understand that there are things you can do in the old school campaigns to make them more direct, what we call direct response friendly. You know, showing that we spent this money, we got these customers. I mean, you can do a few things, but digital advertising, specifically search engines and social networks, they're more quantifiable than the old school channels, number one. Number two, you can optimize them more quickly. And number three, and most importantly, you can target humans infinitely better than you can in any traditional medium. You can target the specific 18 different subsets of customers for every client, or whatever they are. You can target for different ways on search engines versus social networks, but being able to target a, uh, the prospective customer and know exactly who who he or she uh, are and what they want to what they want to hear and what kind of ad to put in front of them that's that's the power of of digital ad, uh, uh, marketing. And you also mentioned that Facebook and Google are some of the lead digital media and advertising platforms out there. Yeah, no, so it, this has been the case for, um, you know, Google has, you know, since 2000, 2001, 2002, Google has been uh, one of, if not the best, most effective, profitable, scalable digital channel. Uh, and when Facebook uh, launched their 
uh, paid advertising platform and started to really fine tune it. Uh, I'm going to say about around 2011, 2012, thereabouts. So uh, between Facebook and Google in particular, uh, they are so far and beyond the other digital channels from a sophistication of their, their, the platforms that we as marketers use to target people. Um, their platforms are often the most sophisticated. Um, number one, number two, they're, they're, they're not the easiest things to use, but they're fairly, um, if you've got a very good team working with you, you can do some pretty advanced things. And it, it doesn't hurt that you know, when you've got hundreds of millions or billions of users uh, and the ability to target people very, very, very granularly, like that's, that's pretty powerful. But yes, fit between Facebook and Google, those still remain um, the, the, you know, the, the biggest one-two punch that nearly every company um, is using to generate new customers. Any other platforms that you would recommend? Sure. So again, outside of you know, you, you've, Bing is a very relevant, important. You know, it's um, if you're doing things in house or you're just starting from a digital advertising standpoint, you can just start with a Google and Facebook team and 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 campaigns, and you'll 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 do quite a bit of good work. But Bing is very important. So Google, Bing, Yahoo is probably uh, as a brand likely to to go away. But so the tier one search engines are important, and you should use all of them if you've got the rec a good agency or a good team. So as of today, you, you've got Google, Bing, and Yahoo. Um, Facebook obviously owns Instagram, so both Facebook and Instagram uh, as paid advertising channels to generate new customers. Uh, LinkedIn, which, is, um, which has up until recently not been the most profitable channel from a digital advertising standpoint, from a direct response standpoint, uh, LinkedIn's come a tremendous way um, in their uh, platform's recognition of Hey, we can appropriately monetize and target customers and help businesses find new customers and customers find good products and services. So they're, they're getting there. That's, that's an exciting thing that's happening. Um, and aside from that, you've got what are, you know, we call them display ads, but banner ads. Um, there are giant platforms that you can use to basically like buying banner ads on the NASDAQ. Uh, Google owns a giant, if not the, the, the biggest and best version of um, a display network. Uh, but there are many others. So you've got the tier one search engines, you've got Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and then you've got um, larger networks and companies where you can buy uh, display ads or banner ads. So those are the three buckets, places where, where people should advertise. Your book also points out four essential things that every company should do tomorrow morning. Tell us what those are and why they're so important. So what we call the core four are the things that I feel any company on earth that is interested in spending money to try to get net new customers. Four things that they might not be the most sophisticated things in the digital marketing ecosystem, but they are the four things that uh, nearly always um, are fairly easy to build and often can be done in-house, number one. Number two, they're, they're not very expensive um, to either build them or run them on a monthly basis. And three, and, and most importantly, uh, are incredibly profitable. So low cost per acquisition. So the cost to uh, get a new customer are, are pretty low. So uh, those three attributes are within these four tactics. Uh, and again, I just like the fact that these things you can often do without an agency, even though agencies would love you to believe that you need us for everything. So those four things are pretty straightforward. It's, it's what we call trade name search or trade name brand search. It is when you're advertising the name of your company uh, on Google or Bing. Um, and there's a lot more details to how to do it correctly. It's not that easy, but it is still fairly straightforward. So trade name search. The second is retargeting banner ads. So you've, I'm sure if you shop for a car in the past 15 years, you'll be on a website that has nothing to do with cars, but you'll see a banner ad and it has the exact year, make and model of a dealership right down the street. And so that's because you are on a website and you're cookied and uh, a company is targeting you with a very relevant ad. Again, super easy, super cheap, and very profitable, so retargeting banner ads. Um, the third are the use of what are called landing pages. If you are driving human beings to your homepage, you are setting money on fire. Your main marketing website, uh, your homepage has a bunch of different jobs, talking to current customers, future customers, uh, uh, the press, um, any number of different audiences a landing page or what were called microsites before, they have one job. 
And that job is to turn visitors into conversations or customers, and they're very, very effective at that. So if you're driving human beings, prospective customers, to your homepage, it's incredibly inefficient. So three is the use of landing pages, and fourth um, are the use of social networks, mostly Facebook, and you can also use LinkedIn, but social networks, what Facebook would call custom audience targeting. It's really easy. You basically take all of your leads or prospective customers or even current customers. You take their email addresses and you upload them into Facebook and you can target those exact humans every morning with a message. So it's less about net new um, customer generation, but it's about what we call nurturing, uh, taking people that are you're in a conversation with but have yet to buy your product or their current customers and you like to make them better. Um, uh, audience, custom audience targeting in Facebook and LinkedIn has their own version, but using social networks to nurture leads um, is also pretty easy to set up. Um, it's incredibly profitable and it's not that expensive to, to operate on a monthly basis. So those four things are, um, I would be hard pressed to think of any company on earth who would be interested in having new clients, I'd be hard pressed to think of a company where those four things are not all the first things I would do. So then what advice do you have for people who are just uh, setting up a business or entrepreneurs who are looking to get into digital advertising? To get into digital advertising or for, their, so, com for their companies? For their companies. That's, that's a great question. So uh, the book is primarily for executives or large, of larger companies to make sure that they are, that they are um, being given good services by their agency or they're doing good digital in-house. But this book is also for uh, the small business owner and or the entrepreneur. Um, whose jobs it is not to be digital marketers. The things that are important to do even for a, um, you know, a, a brand new startup who's just, who has maybe a little bit of funding um, or you know, truckloads of VC capital. It, it, these things, those four things that I mentioned, those core four, uh, those are still things that I, it, you know, agnostic of the type of startup. Again, a, a SaaS company or a new services business. Those four things, especially because you can do them without an agency and they're pretty inexpensive. And, and certainly for startups, like that's a big deal. You know, capital is limited and, and every dollar counts. And so not only are these things fairly easy, number one, number two, you probably can't afford an agency yet, probably. And so anything you can do in-house, it's not that hard, it's very profitable. That's why it's phenomenal. So yes, those core four tactics are super important for giant companies to make sure they're doing perfectly before they get to more advanced stuff. But those core four things, certainly for startups, like that's may, maybe for the first year you don't have to do anything more uh, from, a, from a marketing standpoint, which is fantastic. So what metrics and, and data and analytics do you think are important to sort of understand and evaluate sure. from a marketing perspective? So the, there's always the reality that you know, data being a really, really dangerous word in, in marketing and in business. Um, because uh, not just from a the ubiquity and everyone needs more data. Um, I think in the world of marketing, it's really easy to look at uh, what I'll call vanity metrics um, or things that are interesting, but they don't help you make more money. So, um, so here's what you, you, here's what you shouldn't be focusing on um, in any marketing meeting, and I, I don't care if it's a mid-level manager or the chief marketing officer he or she are having their. Their, their monthly meeting with their entire staff or the agency. If you're talking about retweets and likes and shares and impressions, if you're talking about impressions or clicks even, you are talking about all of the wrong stuff. Clicks and impressions don't put food on your table. Um, likes on Facebook don't drive, don't help you drive more customers. It's not saying the things that are like, it's not saying that our reporting you know, our advanced BI platform doesn't talk about impressions or clicks, but from an executive standpoint, certainly from a business owner standpoint or, or first, or a C-level executive, if you're not talking primarily about volume of leads and cost per lead, volume of qualified sales leads that come from that, and the cost per qualified sales lead, and the number of new customers you got from that marketing campaign, from that campaign, specifically from that campaign and the cost per acquisition, the cost per, the cost per sale. If you're not talking about those three KPIs, cost per lead, cost per qualified sales lead, and cost per sale, and like obviously the volume of each of those, if in a marketing setting you're not talking about those um, leads, qualified sales leads, and sales, in a marketing conversation, 
and you're talking about and you're talking more about impressions and clicks, you are you are hurting your company. It is a dangerous thing to slip into, and, and here's why it happens. Um, you know, I don't think marketer. I don't think I inherently think people are good and professionals want to be be awesome. And I I certainly don't think marketers are bad people because I'm one of them. And I I, I think I, I think it's. Everyone wants professionally to do a very good job and, and, and improve their career and their, their, what they do on a daily basis. However, it is really easy as a marketing professional, whether it's an agency or an employee, when an executive who is not a professional marketer is asking you a question, it is very easy, again, specifically in digital marketing, because there's so, there's so few executives that know enough to ask the second or third question it's really easy to not volunteer and raise your head and say like, you know what, I should be held accountable to revenue and profit. It's so easy to not voluntarily say, you know what, marketing has changed quite a bit in the past 20 years. We should be held to profitability. You should be asking me tougher questions. It's really easy to embrace the type of marketing conversations that were happening in the 60s and 70s and 80s because those are still happening today. And unless marketers raise their hand and say, Hey, I know we're talking about impressions and, 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 and clicks and, and views and shares, but like, you should really be asking me tougher questions. Often, unless a marketer volunteers and says, like, actually, we should be tied to profitability. We should be tied to cost per, cost per sale. Those are often the reasons why those conversations don't happen. Or it takes a C-level executive uh, or a leader in a company to, you know, you don't have to read my book, but have some kind of education in that, in that regard so that they know that marketing should be accountable to client and customer generation and profitability. But unless executives are forcing that conversation, and conversations should be about those kind of KPIs, unless they're leading that charge, it's probably not gonna happen. So it, again, we, we, I hear, I'm around um, uh, conversations, uh, certainly with prospective uh, customers or friends or peers, and they're talking about things that are, that, that you know, I'll call them vanity metrics, stuff that like, it makes executives feel good, but it has nothing to do with driving more customers or making more money. So what are the questions then that CEOs should be asking their marketing leaders based on everything that you just said? At a high level, every weekly or monthly, the bigger conversations, you know, the keystone conversations that executives are having with their, their marketing leaders or their marketing teams. If there is a continual um, focus on at a can and it can be at a campaign level. It can get granular. It can be not down to like the ad, the ad itself or the keyword, but it should be a campaign. So not just search engines and not just Google, but search engine marketing, Google, and we, let's say we have ten different services. Well, what about you know? Um, hey Mary, what about our service line? How is that service line's campaign doing on Google um, from a number of net new leads generated and what's been on a cohort basis? the cost per sale. So that's an example of a conversation. It doesn't have to get down to the, the really, really into the weeds, but you should be having on absolutely monthly basis. Um, take your, if you've got, if you're a brick and mortar, if you've got physical locations, that's a good example. If you've got service lines or product lines, um, I'm a service business, so we, we, do, we do web design. So I would ask my marketing team, if I wasn't a marketer, or if, and we weren't an agency, but if we had hired an agency, I would ask them, look, for our web design service line, how did those campaigns, not just in search engines, but on Google, for our web design products, how many new customers did you drive uh, in, in April or May? Um, and what was the cost to acquire each of those customers within Google for our, that service line? And compare that to the web design campaign that you ran on Facebook or, or, or LinkedIn. And let's compare how many leads you got from each of those and what the cost per sale was. And then you can start seeing um, where, as an executive, you should put your money. And then that's not rocket surgery, that's I've got this much of a budget, you're gonna spend as much money in the channels that have the lowest cost per acquisition. And you just go down the, the list uh, to, you know, from the, the most profitable campaigns to, to the least, until you run out of money. So when you say cost, you say cost per acquisition. What are some of the, the key indicators, key metrics that actually go into figuring out what the cost per acquisition is. Yeah, no, it's the, the math is, here's the good news. Um, digital advertising from like the technology and platforms is pretty pretty hard. Um, I've spent 20 years learning and I'll keep hopefully getting better every month when I can work with 
mostly younger, smarter professionals. Um, uh, but the good news is the math is really easy. The, you know, the, there, there's very basic mathematics deployed when talking about marketing performance. You've got, um, again, the most important KPI in the world is cost per acquisition or cost per sale. Um, in using an example in the in the higher education world, it's, it's cost per enrollment. Um, in the automotive world, cost per sale. So, to get that, it's it's really it's really simple. Um, you've got in the numerator the money is spent, and the denominator how many sales you made, and that is uh, by campaign or or by platform level. So, Google, uh, for our clients, has uh, a fairly stable and consistent cost per acquisition. It uh, for client A. Google, for client A's service line, number one, uh, Google month over month typically has a X thousands of dollars per, per sale. And that's the average uh, money it takes. If we spend, I'm just making this up, if I spend $2,000 on Google, I'll know that I'll probably get a net new customer for my clients for $2,000, because that's the average cost per sale. So the math is really, really simple. It's just, again, it's the dedication and persistence um, the, the determination to just always talk about those, those metrics um, and, and just be aggressive with, with understanding the real results. I'm not saying don't talk about impressions, I'm saying talk about cost per sale, how many leads were driven and how many sales came from those leads by campaign, by channel. And marketers have that information. You know, I, I, I often, I am, I am concerned when I hear, whether it's in uh, uh, companies my friends run or, or just in general conversations, I'm really concerned that often the answer is, well, we can't get the data. I've been doing this a long time. And I've, I grew up professionally in some, uh, again, before I started an agency, I grew up in some of my old jobs with some of the worst, like trash can fire level reporting, a lack of access, terrible, terrible access to data. And not once, and not one company I've worked with or consulted with, not once was it impossible, even on a manual basis, to get the things that I was just talking about. It might be a pain in the butt to get to. You might not have a really fancy BI tool and you can't get the answer in 10 seconds, but I guarantee you a mid-level marketer can probably pull a manually piece those things together to give that to their, to their, to their board or their executive team. So just ask the questions. How do some of the, the privacy laws and government regulations around sure. advertising impact marketing campaigns on social media and some of these uh, platforms? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, one of, if not the, the, best, the best arrow in the quiver of digital advertising, one of, if not the reason that digital advertising is such a profitable and, and awesome, awesome vehicle for, for generating new customers is the ability to target. The ability to take the 1.5 billion Facebook users and say these are, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, these are the 3,200 people within Pittsburgh on Facebook that meet the, the eight or 10 psychographic profile or demographic data points that would be a really good prospective customer for my client, right? So it's about targeting. If and when the platforms themselves or thanks to the, the court of public opinion or the, the federal, or federal government or other, um, other pressures, if there are uh, things that demand some of those targeting features or the access to data is uh, restricted or limited, that absolutely will typically adversely affect um, how good of a job you can do with digital advertising. Um, you know, I could talk for a long time about um, the, 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 the high degree of interest I have with people using a free thing for three, four, five hours a day that's kind of the center of our, you know, our entertainment hub, which are you know, social media as an example, and we use these things for free, and then we question the platforms using our information to show us ads that are more relevant. So, I mean, I question personally the, um, uh, the, the concern. Uh, that being said, if and when there are uh, attempts made to limit um, the ability for a Facebook, as an example, uh, to use your information uh, to better target or know who you are to put the right ad in front of you. you know, that's going to adversely affect typically uh, the upside of digital advertising. So it's, it's typically from an advertiser standpoint, those are not good things. Um, you know, I do think it's important to not, 
not have your social security number be sold to Russians. I think that's an important thing. But like, there's a real giant, you know, uh, good middle area um, that I think we're, 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 we'll probably get to a good stasis. But certainly, in in, in the, the recent um, things in recent news, uh, it's still very much in flux. So honestly, I can't tell you next year um, how much access I as an advertiser will have to. Uh, information to target people on Facebook. Yeah, that's still very much in flux, obviously. Now for people who are doing business overseas and globally, mm -hmm. how do we account for our marketing tactics when we're thinking about um, sure. a global? So um, from a digital marketing standpoint, uh, internationally, it's uh, the good news is uh, if you just look at the past, even t going back 10, 15 years, um, search engines is an example. It's been a pretty stable market. You've got Google, and you've got everybody else. And so the good news, if you, uh, whether you're based in the United States and have divisions overseas, or you sell things overseas, or, or vice versa, the good news is um, the platforms are very similar. You're still going to be using Google, whether you're uh, in the UK or in the US. Um, you're still going to use social networks. And that same example, Facebook is global. Um, it's, it is still, it is, that's going to be the largest lever for you to pull. So the good news is uh, that the platforms are very similar. So you're not going to have to learn a new language. Aside from learning a new language from an advertising standpoint, you don't have to, to, to learn new platforms, um, typically. Uh, and, but from, um, number one. Number two, from a, a strategy standpoint, the strategies are pretty similar. You're still right person, right ad, right time for good price. So that's still the strategy. Um, and if you're using the same platforms, the strategies and tactics are the same. The, the things that do change are, are, are the content, and it's the message. It is the creative, it's the video, the, the image, the, uh, the words being used, and not just obviously because it's so foreign language. Uh, so culturally, those things do change in terms of what, um, you know, the, the recipe for a successful campaign in the U.S., you know, does not mean you can do the same thing in Dubai. Um, and you'll even find the same thing uh, within the United States. I mean, obviously, not just demographically, but regionally, you're, you're not running the same campaign um, in Charleston, South Carolina, that you're running in Los Angeles. But so, so similar things. So the bottom line, though, the good news from a digital marketer standpoint internationally, um, at least uh, this year, you're able to do very similar platforms, if not the same platforms, with similar tactics, which is really good news. Well, Tom, this was great. Thank really you so much. Really appreciate you coming. Appreciate your time. And good luck with your book. Thank you. It's my first, so we'll see how it goes. And we'll see you next time on Sartor TV.